Hello everyone, welcome back for more nervous system physiology. So now that we have covered the basics, I would say, we're going to move into possibly one of the most complicated things that we're going to talk about all semester. So I definitely recommend that you kind of buckle in and make sure that you're paying attention here because this stuff, abstract and complicated as it may sound, is going to be very, very important. So let's go ahead and get into the membrane potential and the role that ion channels play in changing that membrane potential. So up until this point, we should feel reasonably good about our understanding of kind of what neurons are, what they do in terms of sending long distance messages. But if we're really going to understand the circumstances under which a neuron will or will not fire one of those action potential messages, we need to understand that neuron's underlying electrical activity. So one thing you may recall back from chapter four is that when we referred to both neurons and muscle cells, we said that they are excitable. Let's talk about what excitable means. Every cell in your body has what is called a membrane potential. The membrane potential refers to a difference or discrepancy in electrical charges between the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid on either side of this plasma membrane. So if you'll recall, we have ions like sodium and potassium and calcium that carry net positive charges. And then you have things like chloride ions, bicarbonate ions, and carbonate ions, which carry net negative charges. So these different ions, as we have seen in the case of sodium and potassium, are distributed on different sides of the membrane in different ways. There's a lot of potassium inside the cell and a lot of sodium outside the cell. So that's going to be those sorts of things will be true for other ions as well. So the membrane potential refers to basically how much more positive or how much more negative is the intracellular fluid when compared to the extracellular fluid extracellular fluid if you were to kind of add all those charges up. So what the reality is, is that for most cells in your body, the inside, the intracellular fluid is a little bit more negative than the extracellular fluid. So that creates what is going to be referred to as a negative membrane potential. So that's true for every cell in your body, but we said already that only neurons and muscle fibers really are excitable. So an excitable cell is going to be one that has the capability to change its membrane potential to achieve certain goals, like sending electrical messages. And the way that a cell will change its membrane potential is by opening and closing ion channels to allow certain ions to move from one side to another so that we can change the distribution of electrical charges across the membrane. So think back to chapter three, right? So we use kind of sodium and potassium as our two best examples. So the intracellular fluid contains a lot more potassium than the extracellular fluid, and the extracellular fluid contains a lot more sodium than the intracellular fluid. Do you happen to remember what maintains these steep concentration gradients for sodium and potassium? Well, you might wanna go back and review the sodium potassium pump, right? Okay, so with that being said, most of the time, these ions cannot follow their concentration gradients for a couple of reasons. Number one, the cell membrane itself, as we've said many times, is impermeable to electrically charged solutes. So sodium and potassium, for example, cannot just move across the membrane by simple diffusion because the membrane prevents that. So for cases like that, we said, if a solute cannot move across the membrane all by itself, it needs a channel or a carrier. So sodium and potassium, they can't move across the membrane, but they could possibly have channels to let them through. <coughs> so the problem, the reason why sodium and potassium usually can't move on their own is because any ion channels that could let them through are usually going to be closed. So we're talking about ion channels that are closed most of the time, and will really only open under a very specific set of circumstances. And we can actually classify and categorize ion channels on the basis of what causes them to open and close. 
Not before we do that, we need to say a little something about the stringency of ion channels. How selective are they? Well, ion channels are very selective, meaning that they are very particular about what kind of ion moves through. So at first, ion channels are charge exclusive, meaning that any particular ion channel is not going to let both positive and negative charges through. So not cations and anions, either one or the other. And then in addition to that, ion channels tend to be size exclusive too, meaning that not only are they discriminating on the basis of whether the ion is positive or negative, but also on the basis of how big it is. So generally speaking, the smallest kind of ion is a hydrogen ion, and then you go up to sodium and magnesium and potassium and then all the way up to phosphate as the ions get bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you think of a channel as having kind of a diameter to it in terms of a tunnel that an ion can move through, anything bigger than the permissible diameter is not going to get through. Now, the biggest conclusion that we can draw here is that because of both the size and the charge exclusives, exclusives, eh, I can't talk today, because the ion channels are both size and charge exclusive, usually most ion channels are only going to let one specific thing through. So we can talk about sodium channels that just let sodium through and nothing else. We can talk about potassium channels that let just potassium through and nothing else. That's usually going to be the case. So if we do have a channel that's specific for, say, sodium, and only sodium can pass through, well, sodium is only going to be able to pass through if the channel's open. And we just got done saying these types of channels are usually going to be closed most of the time. So for these types of channels that open and close in response to specific physiological stimuli, we say that these channels are gated. We call these gated channels. And as I said before, we can categorize these channels on the basis of what triggers them to open. The first that we will talk about is called a ligand-gated channel. So we've actually talked a little bit about this in the communication unit. A ligand-gated channel will only open in response to a ligand binding to the channel itself or to a nearby G-protein-coupled receptor that will activate a signal transduction mechanism that will result in the channel opening. So this is interesting because it turns out that all neurotransmitter receptors, of which we will discuss later in this chapter, all neurotransmitter receptors are ligand-gated ion channels. And activation of these receptors by a neurotransmitter is going to change the membrane potential of the target cell because if we open an ion channel, we're going to cause sodium to move into the cell or potassium to leave the cell And that's going to change the charge distribution, and it's going to have big, big, big implications for the target cell. So in these pictures here, you can see a neurotransmitter like acetylcholine binding to this channel. And after the binding occurs of ligand to receptor, the channel opens, and now a certain type of ion can move through, but not others. A second type of gated channel is what's called a mechanically gated channel. So the idea here is a little bit different. So mechanically gated channels are not open by ligands, but rather by different types of physical stressors like touch, pressure, vibration, and even temperature changes. So at the cellular level, the way this works is that these types of stimuli are going to change the shape of and distort the plasma membrane in such a way that it affects the protein such that the channel will open up. So this will cause what we are later going to understand as a graded potential or generator potential and this and those terms are not necessarily specific to mechanically gated channels. Anytime you open ligand mechanically gated ion channels or otherwise, you are going to cause a temporary change in the membrane potential of your target cell, and we call those things graded potentials. And then finally, the last type is called a voltage gated channel. Now these are particularly important. Voltage-gated channels are only going to open when the membrane potential of that particular cell is at or above a certain threshold value, meaning if the membrane potential is below this threshold value, the channel is going to be closed. 
If you're at or above that value, then it's going to be open. It's as simple as that. So the best example of these types of voltage-gated channels that we are going to see later is what are called voltage-gated sodium channels. Every neuron has these on their axon, and when we excite a neuron such that it gets its membrane potential up to a threshold of at least negative 55 millivolts, then these channels will open, and as we're going to see, that is the first event that has to happen in an action potential. But more on that later. Okay, so one more type of channel that is actually not a gated channel. These are called leak channels. So leak channels we can basically assume are open all the time. So I said most of these channels are going to be closed most of the time. Well, there's a reason why I said most, right? Because there are these leak channels that are essentially open all the time. Now, they do open and close, but they do that kind of frivolously and randomly, right? So really we can kind of assume that they're open all the time. So it turns out that the cell membrane has a high concentration of potassium leak channels, meaning that potassium actually has a very high tendency to leak out from the intracellular fluid into the extracellular fluid through these leak channels, which explains why the membrane is much, much more permeable to potassium than it is to sodium. So here's a question for you. If potassium is always leaking out of the cell, how do we get that potassium back into the cell? Sodium potassium pump, as always. Okay, so let's talk about what's called the resting membrane potential. So as we've already said, most cells in the body are much more negative on the inside as compared to the outside. So the difference in charges, whatever it may be, can be quantified by the placement of voltage recording electrodes. You'll notice we have this voltmeter here with a recording electrode stuck into the intracellular fluid and then a reference electrode out here in the extracellular fluid. So whatever the voltmeter reads is going to be a quantification of the difference in charges between those two electrodes, between the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. So for most cells that are maintaining a resting membrane potential, meaning these cells are at rest, they're not being excited with anything, most cells in the body are going to carry a resting membrane potential value of negative 70 millivolts. So that potential will change if an ion channel opens, and at that point we would no longer call it the resting membrane potential because the only thing that's going to cause an ion channel to open is if a cell has become stimulated in some way. And if that's the case, it is no longer resting. So let me go ahead and just tell you a couple of things here. So first, why is this a negative number and what does that tell us? Well, the first thing to remember is that if the membrane potential of a cell is negative, that tells you the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside. So as long as that value is below zero and is a negative number, the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside. Now, if that number becomes a positive number greater than zero, then we have flipped the polarity there and the inside is now more positive than the outside. So that's hint number one. The sign of the membrane potential, whether it is positive or negative, will always tell you whether the inside is more positive or negative than the outside. Most of the time, it's going to be more negative. And then the size of the number gives you an idea of how great the discrepancy is. So if we were to double how much more negative the inside is compared to the outside, we would change that membrane potential to negative 140 rather than negative 70. As the number gets closer and closer to zero, the smaller and smaller the discrepancy becomes. If we're at negative one millivolt, the inside would be just barely more negative than the outside. So that's hint number two. This, the magnitude of the number tells you how big the discrepancy is, whether it's a positive or a negative number.
So our two favorite ions that we've kind of had to talk about up until this point are sodium and potassium. So what I want to walk you through now is a little activity showing you how the membrane potential is going to change when we open particular ion channels. In this case, we're talking about sodium and potassium. All right, so you're looking at a cell here, and the first thing for you to go ahead and remember is that we've got these huge concentration gradients for sodium and potassium that are generated by the sodium-potassium pump. There's a high concentration of sodium outside the cell, and there's a high concentration of potassium inside the cell. As we said, usually, most, usually these uh, concentration gradients cannot be relieved because any ion channels that could let them through are usually closed, these gated channels. They are closed because we have not received the appropriate physiological stimulus, whatever that may be, to cause them to open. So when a cell is at rest like this, the membrane potential is set at negative 70 and the inside is more negative than the outside. So what happens if we open a sodium channel? So let's say we get some sort of stimulus that opens the sodium channel. Well, now sodium can move down its concentration gradient. It can move from the outside to the inside. Sodium is a positively charged ion. So as sodium starts to rush into the cell, the inside of the cell is going to become progressively more and more positive. And as the inside becomes more positive compared to the outside, the membrane potential is going to go up and up and up until it gets to, say, positive 30 millivolts. At that point, if it gets to positive 30, then now we're at a point where the inside is now more positive than the outside, and we have totally flipped the polarity here. So as positive charges move into the cell, the membrane potential is going to go from negative 70 to negative 60, negative 50, all the way up to zero, and then all the way up to, say, positive 30, for example. What about the opposite? What if we open a potassium channel instead? Well, potassium is now able to move down its concentration gradient, but it's going to move the opposite direction. It will start leaving the cell. Potassium, as a positively charged ion, is now leaving the cell, and what few positive charges were already inside the cell at negative 70 millivolts, they are now leaving, and the inside is now going to become even more negative than it already was. So in a case like this, where you've got potassium leaving the cell, the inside becomes even more negative, and the membrane potential goes below negative 70, say to something like negative 90 millivolts. So those are the two types of changes that we can get to the membrane potential by opening an ion channel. We can either cause the inside to become more positive, or we can cause it to become even more negative than it already was. We will cover this in just a few minutes, but we are going to call those changes depolarization and hyperpolarization, and we will be sure to use those terms a lot. But before we discuss those things, let's have a short uh, kind of philosophical discussion on why the intracellular fluid is usually more negative than the ECF to begin with. Well, first of all, the inside of the cell has DNA. You may not know this, but DNA is very negatively charged, and it's always going to be inside the cell, stuck inside the nucleus. We cannot have DNA outside the cell. It just does not work that way. So the inside of the cell is going to attract positive ions to help to balance those negative charges on the DNA. There's no need for such a mechanism in the extracellular fluid, and since the cell membrane is very permeable to potassium because of those leak channels, the DNA draws in a lot of potassium, which helps to explain why there's so much potassium inside the cell. A lot of proteins in the intracellular fluid and also on the inside part of the phospholipid bilayer are negatively charged too. And then finally, the cytosol contains negative ions like phosphate that are found in much lower concentrations in the ECF. Now, this is all going to give you the impression that the intracellular fluid is just totally negatively charged, but that's not quite what we're saying. It's not so much that the intracellular fluid is just all negative charges. There's plenty of positive charges as well, like potassium, 
But what we're actually measuring here is not the absolute value of the total electrical charge in each place, but rather it's a relative comparison. When we say that the membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts, what we're saying is just that the intracellular fluid is more negative or less positive than the extracellular fluid. For all we know, it's hard to measure these things, but for all we know, the intracellular fluid could actually be a net positive. But if the extracellular fluid is even more positive, then the intracellular fluid will appear negative by comparison. Okay, so let's put this all together and try to figure out how neurons send messages by changing their membrane potential. So the key to getting an action potential, which is the method by which neurons send messages very quickly, this all has to do with a neuron's ability to start at its resting value of negative 70 millivolts and to change that. We're talking about excitability here. So let's review. How can a cell change its membrane potential? Well, it does so by opening ion channels, right? And as we've seen, a lot of these gated ion channels will only open when we get an appropriate stimulus, whether it's a neurotransmitter ligand or whether it's some type of sensory stimulus that activates a mechanically gated channel, whatever it may be. If we can open ion channels on the dendrites or cell body of a neuron, this is going to cause a very localized and transient change to the local membrane potential called a graded potential. Now, a graded potential is not the same thing as an action potential. As we said much earlier in the chapter, action potentials start at a place on the neuron called the axon hillock, which is on the other side of the cell body. The dendrites are on the opposite side from the axon hillock. So we start with the graded potential, and then depending on what the graded potential does, we may or may not get an action potential. So as we've mentioned, graded potentials occur in one of two ways. We can either cause the membrane potential to become more positive, which we call depolarization, such as if we open a sodium channel, or if we say open a potassium channel, the inside will become even more negative than it already was, and we call that hyperpolarization. So in this graph that you're looking at here, the dotted line, the horizontal dotted line, is showing you the resting membrane potential value. This upward deflecting graph is depolarization, in which we open an ion channel that causes the inside to become more positive. So the membrane potential goes up towards zero. That's why we call it depolarization. The cell is polarized as long as the membrane potential is not zero. So by getting it to climb up towards zero, we are in the process of taking the polarization away or depolarizing it. On the other hand, if we go down and deflect down from the resting membrane potential so that we become even more negative than we already were, we call that hyperpolarization. Well, why do we care about these? Um, so what, what difference does it make whether we depolarize or hyperpolarize? Well, it turns out if your goal is to get an action potential, you want depolarization. We call it excitatory depolarization, for reasons that we will discuss later, gets you closer and closer and closer towards getting that action potential that you desire. On the other hand, hyperpolarization is inhibitory. It makes an action potential much more difficult to achieve. It takes you further and further and further away from your action potential. Think of it kind of like running a race. Depolarization is like taking steps towards the finish line. Hyperpolarization is like taking steps backward away from the finish line. So if we want a neuron to send a message as an action potential, we want to depolarize that neuron rather than hyperpolarize it. All right, so that is going to do it for this video. A lot of information that you're probably going to want to take a break and digest. But when we come back, we will start putting things together and we will start specifically talking about the graded potential. And as we've already said, the graded potential comes in two varieties. You can either get depolarization or hyperpolarization. So I will look forward to seeing you next time.